very much. So today I want to tell you about uh, migration as a form of adaptation to climate change, and I'm going to focus on the case of Bangladesh. Um, so just for a little bit of background, if you live in Bangladesh, right here in South Asia, actually a neighbor of Bhutan, uh, you live in a space about the size of Wisconsin with about 30 times as many people. Um, so in Bangladesh, that means there are about 3,000 people per square mile compared to Ohio, where we have about 300 people per square mile. So what that means is that anything that happens in Bangladesh, even if it's fairly localized, is going to affect huge numbers of people. Um, Bangladesh is actually doing quite well, despite having um, relatively low income per capita, about $3,500 a person. Um, we've actually been sustaining 6% GDP growth over the last 10 to 15 years, right, which is awesome. We would love to see that here in the US. Right? Um, and they've made great investments in health and education. So life expectancy has increased. Primary schooling completion has increased. They're now the world's second largest um, exporter of textiles, second only to China. And the World Bank considers them among the top 12 developing countries. But the biggest challenge uh, for Bangladesh is sustainable development, right? To, in order to sustain this development into the future, uh, is actually something that's almost entirely beyond our control. And that's climate change. So we know that with climate change worldwide, we're going to be looking at warmer temperatures. We're going to be looking at changes in rainfall patterns. Right? So it's going to have huge effects, particularly in the agricultural sector. And in Bangladesh, most of their agriculture is rain-fed. They don't have a lot of irrigation, so they're really dependent on these rainfall patterns. Uh, and 87% of the rural population here depends on agriculture for their life. And there are also some things about Bangladesh that make it particularly vulnerable to climate change. So in Bangladesh, you have, uh, it's actually the world's largest river delta, which means it lies at the point where three of the world's largest rivers come together and flow into the sea. So you have the Ganges running through India, like the Brahmaputra through China and Bhutan, uh, and the Magna. So what this implies is that what happens in Bangladesh depends a lot on what happens in these upstream countries. Okay. So ironically, Bhutan's efforts to harness hydroelectric power and put dams in is going to have huge implications for Bangladesh. Right? That could be very bad. Right? And very bad for their system. And similarly with climate change, right, we're seeing, as I mentioned in Bhutan, right, melting snow, so that's changing river flows. We're seeing um, increased droughts, right? so that's also going to encourage these countries to look at damming their rivers to provide more irrigation, which has huge implications uh, downstream. Okay. On top of that, as a delta, um, Bangladesh is very low line. So on this uh, map on the right-hand side, any area that isn't green is basically within 10 meters of sea level. And you can see that those areas are also extremely densely populated. So those are all the darker red areas on the left map. So within 10 meters of sea level, that means you know, even with a particularly high tide, certainly with a large storm, a lot of those areas are going to be inundated with salt water. And here we have satellite images. On the left is sort of a normal um, water coverage in Bangladesh. On the right is during a cyclone in 2007. And you can see all that blue creeping in, all those areas covered by seawater. Current estimates suggest that by the year 20, uh, 2050, 17% of the country is going to be covered by water, it's going to be underwater. Um, and that's going to displace about 18 million people. To give you a sense of magnitudes, Current estimates suggest that uh, people displaced by the Syrian conflict are about 11 million currently. And so we're talking about potentially huge numbers of uh, climate or environmental refugees. And here you can see, obviously, by 2100, um, just to give you a sense of kind of scale, right, how much um, of, of the country is going to be underwater under current climate scenarios. On top of that, the land is actually sinking in Bangladesh. So this is a process called subsidence, which is driven a lot by groundwater extraction. So as you can imagine, as rainfall patterns are changing with climate change, people are going to need more water for irrigation. They're going to pump more water out of the ground. Uh, and that's going to lead to more subsidence. And already, the land is sinking at about half an inch a year. 
Okay, so what can people do um, to adapt to climate change? Well, one thing they can do in Bangladesh, and they've been doing it, is putting their houses up on stilts. And because this is a monsoon environment, people are actually used to um, annual flooding in a lot of areas. So they've already been doing this. This is what it looks like when, uh, when it actually, when the monsoon comes in, and you can see people travel by boat. They can convert some of their farmland into fishing or shrimp ponds, or either just the wet season or uh, for the entire year. They, uh, I love this picture. They actually started putting their schools on boats, solar panel on the boat, and they can just tool around and pick up kids from their homes and uh, go to school on the boat. And the other thing they can do, or I guess by the title of my talk, is they can migrate. They can just pick up and move. Um, so this is what my research focuses on. It's part of a larger um, project called Band-Aid that involves um, other researchers here at Ohio State as well as partners in, in Germany and France as well. Um, so even though migration is only one possible way to adapt to climate change, I think it's really important to focus on for a couple of different reasons. So one is that in order to direct our relief and aid efforts appropriately, we need to know where people are in space. We need to know who who is still stuck in the you know, flood affected area who was able to get out, where did they go to. And if we don't know where people are in space, we can end up with you know, horrible situations like we saw after Hurricane Katrina. If our aid efforts just were not directed appropriately, we didn't have enough resources going to the aid. The other reason, of course, that we care about migration is that it's a very extreme response. Right? It's basically saying, I can't make it work here anymore. I'm leaving. Right? Um, so, in that sense, it can be kind of like the, the canary in the coal mine for us, right? As we start to see large numbers of people moving out of certain areas, that's a big you know, warning bell to us that environmental conditions are getting very bad and we need to um, be careful about what's going on moving forward. Okay, so let me give you um, the bad news of what we're finding in our research. So what we looked at here is on the horizontal axis is um, flooding in the previous year, this is the percentage of the um, subdistrict that was covered by water. And on the vertical axis is the outmigration rate. So it's just a raw correlation. You can see it's not perfect, but there is clearly this downward trend. Right? So people who have been the most affected by floods, right, that experience the most severe floods, are much less likely to be moving out of this area. So they seem to be stuck somehow right, when, uh, when these floods come. And so, not surprising, as you can imagine, if it looks like this when you get flooded out, right, you probably don't have any resources with which to migrate, right? You don't have any money to buy the bus ticket, right, to go anywhere. Um, it could also be, right, that all the transportation networks, the roads and everything are washed out, so you can't get anywhere else. And it could be that all the neighboring villages look like this, so there's nowhere to go. The good news, though, is that we find that actually people are proactively moving out, too. Uh, so when times are good, so when they get good rainfall during the monsoon, that increases rice yields, um, increases profits with farmers. So when that happens, they actually are more likely to move out. They are being proactive about this. They seem to recognize the vulnerabilities that they're facing right, and be looking for ways to, um, to be resilient. You can also see this when looking over longer time periods. This is over a decade. You can see the blue dots represent areas where the size of the population has decreased. So a lot of these vulnerable areas along the coast, people have been moving out over this 10 year period. Um, there is some cause for concern though in this picture because the red dots represent areas where there's been population increases. And this is around um, the city of Chittagong, which is the largest, second largest city in Bangladesh. We see people are moving to the city, but that city is also very environmentally vulnerable. So we have to balance this sort of economic growth in cities um, and the appeal of these um, you know, bright lights in the big city against um, that increased vulnerability. And since this project is just sort of getting off the ground, um, one of the big things we're learning actually is that we have a lot more to learn. So one thing is that we find that actually when we ask people, why are you moving? Basically nobody says for environment, you know, because the environment is bad or because of climate change right? or even flooding. <coughs> what they say 60% of the time is for economic reasons. So 
what that means is that we need to understand not the effect of environments and climate on migration, but the effect of environments and climate on economics, and then the effect of economics on migration. Right? So we're kind of missing a step in the middle of right? the step that's really salient. Another thing we're finding is that it's actually really hard to see migrants in most data sets. Right? We don't really know who's moving, where they're moving to, why they're moving, um, and uh, where they're going. So uh, one of the things, uh, so we have you know, large scale data sets like a census would be conducted every you know, maybe five to 10 years. They survey large numbers of people. Um, so we get a good sense of how the population is population is changing when we can survey lots and lots of people like this, but that's not often enough for us to get a good handle on the effects of, of climate change on migration. And so we can look at smaller surveys that are done more frequently, but because they're smaller, it's also hard to gauge how migration is occurring on a larger scale. So one of the things we're going to be testing this year actually is now taking advantage of the spread of cell phones um, and using cell phone surveys. This is much lower in cost. We don't actually have to traipse out into um, the countryside. We don't have to um, worry about visiting all these households specifically, right? We can call them on the phone. We can call them very frequently because it's not very expensive. So the idea is to call them once a month, once every two months, ask them, you know, did you migrate? Where did you go? What are you doing? Um, what happened? We can. Uh, Still call them, right? Even if there's some kind of disaster that occurs, right? Even if all the roads get washed out, we can still call these people on the phone, even if our surveyors couldn't get there in person. We can change up our sample as we need to. If we find that some areas are becoming more vulnerable, we can add more people in to their survey from those areas. So there's a lot of potential um, that's really exciting with the growth of, of cell phone markets um, in developing countries. And this is another study that actually uses metadata on SIM cards to track which towers they're paying. So this was around the cyclone in 2013. You can see during the cyclone, there was a lot of increased uh, movement of cell phones around Chittagong, uh, that large city, uh, versus in Verichel, where there was, uh, you know, closer to the coast, there was like people got sort of stuck by the cyclone. There was a decrease in blue line, there was an abnormal decrease uh, in the movement of those SIM cards. Another thing we'd like to look into um, doing with cell phones is citizen science. So you can get people actually to go out and take pictures of riverbanks, of coastal embankments, and uh, send that data to scientists who can process it and figure out how much erosion has occurred, right, what the water level is. You can also get uh, sensors that attach to your phone that will allow you to measure soil quality and water quality. And so just to harness the power of crowds, right, of people, who can transmit all this information at pretty low cost to scientists, right? So that we don't have to put in sensors everywhere. I and mean, then we can get um, a lot more frequent and a, um, just a larger volume of data. All right, so what does all of this sort of tell us? Well, I think you know, what all of this tells us together is that we need to take a really um, big, big picture view of what's going on when we look at sustainability. Issues, and we need to work across disciplines. Okay, so it can't just be economists like myself using rainfall data in my, in my uh, model. It can't just be a hydrologist putting migration numbers into his model. Right? We actually need to come together to understand how social processes and economic processes are affecting the environment and how the environmental processes are affecting the social and economic processes. Um, so like before, you know, I'll give a, a shout out to the folks that have been supporting our research um, and encourage all of you to look for that sustainable revision. Look for a revision in the way that you approach these big questions about sustainability. Right, thank you.